um, to the Mpumalanga SADA event. Um, just a few uh, house rules. Um, please refrain sorry, from sorry. Dr. Glenn, we're not live yet, sorry. Um, <laughs> and, and please, I'm going to put up a banner for about two minutes. When the banner goes down, then you can start with the welcoming. Yeah, already I was shooting. <laughs> <laughs> Good evening, well, colleagues. Welcome to the Pumalanga event. Um, just a few house rules before we start. Please refrain from using the raised hand, but type your comments and questions in the Q&A tab. The CPD, uh, the CPD certificates will be loaded to the server platform. You and you'll be able to access all your certificates under the member profile. If you see this, uh, that this other member area, yes, sorry. Um, the, the event for tonight qualifies for one clinical CEU. Uh, we are streaming live on YouTube also, just in case you have difficulty to access the Zoom platform. Um, Please uh, be reminded to fill in the evaluation after the webinar. And uh, please remember guys to, to register for the, the Dental Congress, which will be on the 27th to the 29th of August. Uh, SADA has been sending out um, the, the communication regarding that. So our speaker for tonight is Dr. Andre Ace. He qualified at the University of Pretoria in 2001. He's a, a current senior lecturer in the clinical anatomy department in the Department of Anatomy in the University of Pretoria. He has, he has obtained his PhD from uh, University of Pretoria in 2020. So, I mean, that is just a big, a big up for, to him for, quite, for getting a PhD in the midst, in the midst of COVID. And um, he also has numerous publications that includes 25 public, publicized articles. Uh, Dr. Andre Ace, welcome. The platform is all yours.
Yes, good, <clears throat> good evening and uh, thank you for the invitation and uh, for joining us this evening. Um, yes, as I said, uh, the title of tonight's talk is uh, Combium Computed Tomography as a Diagnostic Aid in Dentistry. Um, and um, the first few slides, I just want to focus on some important aspects related to Combium CT. Um, and then I'm going to share some cases where CT uh, helped us in treatment planning and eventually getting us to a diagnosis. Um, <clears throat> I just want to share. Okay, so yeah, to start off with, um, there's two examples of machines currently available on the market. So the one on the left hand side, I just want to quickly grab a pointer there. The one on the left hand side. Um, is a machine made manufactured by Plan Mecca and the one on the right hand side by Serona. So what you can see from this is that these machines have basically got a similar footprint to a normal panoramic unit. Now I want to challenge you right here in the beginning and give you this um, <clears throat> panoramic radiograph um, and I want you to see if you can identify um, or rather Give me an indication, is this CT, is a CT justified in this case? This was a healthy 12 year old patient um, that presented with an anterior open bite and he requested orthodontic uh, treatment. And that's why we acquired this panoramic radiograph. Now, now think about this while I present and um, I'm gonna give you the answer right at the end, but take a moment and have a look at this radiograph and, and see, will you take a CBCT? Is it justified, yes or no? And then we'll, I'll give you the answer right at the end. Okay, so if we look at, at uh, CT, in general, CBCT units can be classified into uh, small, medium, and large fields um, based on the size of the field of view. So obviously your small volume CBCT machines are used to scan um, from a sextant um, or a quadrant to one jaw. Um, just remember that they generally offer higher resolution compared to your bigger field of view machines. Your medium field of view machines are used to scan both jaws, while the large field of view machines are generally used to uh, uh, in ortho or orthodontic surgery. And you, as you can see from that, you can um, scan the whole skull. So if you have a look at this manufacturer, you'll see that they've got the 3D volume there, and you can see the size of the machine or the size that it can scan. Um, a small field of view machine, 50 to 80 millimeters, and then it goes right up to 230 to 160 millimeters. And just to give you an indication right there at the bottom, that's the size that can be scanned by these machines. Um, <clears throat> just another point is to, to look at the voxel size. You'll see that the smaller machines can scan at a lower voxel size and obviously the bigger machines scan at a higher voxel size. Now, unfortunately, one of the limitations um, of these type of machines is um, <clears throat> the size of the field that's being irradiated. So a larger field will sometimes, well, will obviously irradiate a larger field. This is a, a, a nice example to, to look at the, uh, images it was reconstructed and to look at the image quality that we can get from um, the different voxel sizes. Now, a voxel is the smallest 3D element of the volume um, and it's typically presented as a cube or a box with a height, width and a depth. So the voxel size on CBCT uh, images are usually isotropic. So what that means is that the height and the width um, are the same in all dimensions. In other words, uniform. And this is different from some of the medical CTs, which sometimes give you non-isometric uh, or isotropic uh, measurements. So if you're going to do a measurement from a CT, um, it is usually a one-to-one -one measurement. And this is one of the nice advantages of using a CT. Um, as you can see, some of the smaller uh, field of view units can scan at a 75 microns or even some of the machines 76 microns. And you can see the, how nice the images appear. But if you look through these images here, you'll see that if you look at an image of 150 micron, and this was done on a big field of view machine, we only um, <clears throat> took a small volume. You can see that the image is quite nice, 
um, and clear. And you can even identify all these small little canals. It's not only the voxel size that uh, <clears throat> determines the, the image quality. Um, it also, it's got to do with patient movement. If there's metal artifacts in the, the area, and it, of course, the, the scan paramet uh, parameters like your KV and your MA. Here's a nice example. If you look at this image here of a root canal treatment, and you can see that they scatter around, around that tooth. But as we, as we look at that, that image, you'll see that unfortunately, the 75 does give a little bit of a better image quality, but the field of view is small. I've just included this, um, and I just want to briefly touch on this, uh, on the radiation dose related to these mach machines. And I'm going to use the, the Promax 3D here um, as an example. You'll see that uh, if you look at the Promax 3D, the field of view that they used in the study by um, an implant dentistry, you'll see that they, the field of view was the same. So it was an 8 by 8 and an 8 by 8 the, the one, the reference is obviously Powell's and uh, Lundler, and you can see that what they did here is there was different parameters that they used, but what I want to have a look at uh, the difference in effective dose. It actually, there was a difference from 28 right to 652 microsieverts. So you can see that's quite a difference, even though the scan size was the same. Um, <clears throat> You can see that they also give you an indication of equivalent dose here. So this is the dose that's equivalent to the amount of panoramic radiographs. So you'll see that it ranges anything from two to 47. So if you do a scan, an eight by eight scan on this particular machine, it can range from two, equivalent to two panoramic radiographs right up to 47 panoramic radiographs, which is quite high. So those are just the two that we compared. So <clears throat> the effective dose for different CBCT machines showed a 20-fold uh, range. Um, so we've got to make a distinction between small, medium, and large field of view CT scanners and the protocols that you'll use when you scan these patients. So your selection of exposure, exposure parameters and field size really depends on the diagnostic requirements. In quite a recent study um, in uh, DMFR, um, they just showed here that uh, if it, they provide a summary data on adult doses. And what you can see here is that for large field of view, medium field of view and small field of view machines, there's quite a difference what was reported compared to what they found in their studies. Now, Remember the, the reported effective dosages can be that they haven't included all the tissue weighting factors. And that's why if you look at data, you've got to take into account the, the volume size and what tissue was involved. And did they really include that into their calculation? So you can see from here, what is being reported, 23 uh, <clears throat> units compared to 212 units is quite a difference. But what you'll also see is that there's quite a difference between a large field of view, 212, compared to 84. So why embrace 3D? Well, the digital information, what we it directly influences our clinical decisions. Um, and accurate data leads to better treatment planning, decisions, and potentially more predictable outcomes. Now, I'm going to go through a couple of um, we usually get referrals from, from orthodontics, as you can see, and I've included a couple of um, images here. And it's basically to evaluate that three-dimensional location of a tooth and to, ex, uh, to assess whether a tooth is uh, salvageable or not. But it also helps with your surgical planning and uh, technique. So what you can see here, this scan was taken uh, for that impacted uh, third uh, canine. Um, and it really was taken to do the surgical technique and planning for the specific patient. We also sometimes with an impacted tooth want to assess if there's root resorption on the tooth next to it. And then, of course, if you can't move a tooth, um, like in this case, you can see why they struggled moving this tooth because of this dilacerated root, which you can see clearly on um, the CBCT image. 
was and remember with a 2D uh, normal X-ray, sometimes can't see that severe curvatures like in this case. Um, this was a case I was personally involved with. And what you can see here is this was referred to me from a private dentist. And this was the periapical radiograph that the dentist sent, uh, <coughs> sent with the patient. Um, you can see that there's quite complex root and canal anatomy here. And when we took the CT, it actually showed that there were three canals and this C-shaped um, <coughs> root canal configuration. And this really helped me to actually to identify all the canals and to and help me with the access to get into the, all of these canals. So you can see from the, the amount of information that you can gain from the CT. You can see that this was a small field of view um, that was taken for this patient, specifically focusing on that, that tooth. We also get referrals from periodontics. Um, and it's mainly to evaluate bone and bone quality as well as proximity to vital structures. Here you can see a patient um, and you can see the amount of bone in the maxilla and as well as in the mandible. And then you can identify the inferior alveolar canal quite nicely on, these, uh, on this coronal slice. You can also see that there is a thickening of the sinus mucosa, um, related to the floor of the right maxillary sinus. This was just a <clears throat> patient that was referred to where they lost an implant while placing it. And you can see where the, uh, the implant landed up there in the nose, as well as an implant that was placed into the, the nasal fossa here. Um, <clears throat> we also use this, uh, the CBCT for virtual planning of implant placement as well as stent designs. And this is just an example to show you a stent design for implant placement, um, as well as that virtual planning of an implant and you can place it and see exactly how close you are to your um, inferior alveolar or um, any other structures in that area. I, I included this because this was already said in 2012 that a CBCT is an excellent diagnostic modality in implant dentistry that should be used for the evaluation of the proposed implant site to include the presence, uh, to exclude the presence of occult pathology, foreign bodies, and the defects, and to determine the suitability of the site in terms of 3D morphology and proximity to vital anatomical structures. Um, and I do believe that if you want to place an implant, there should be a CT taken before you, you, you place it. You can see this, like I said, it was already mentioned in 2012. We also get referrals from um, <coughs> maxillofacial. And most of this is surgical planning of big pathology cases, as you can see here, this pathology on this 3D representation, as well as tra trauma. Here you can see multiple fractures of the skull. Another image here at the bottom, a sagittal image of the mandible, so showing uh, this lesion extending right into the coronoid process, as well as the neck of the condyle. And then, of course, uh, if you want to do um, removal of wisdom teeth. Yeah, you can see a wisdom tooth. Um, that's the same 3D representation of the image above. And you can see the severe curvature of that root of that wisdom tooth. Um, CBCT is also an excellent modality to view the osseous changes um, related to your TMJ. Unfortunately, we don't see soft tissue changes on a CBCT but it already tells a, a quite a big, a nice story. Here you can see on this <coughs> image, the uh, erosion of the superior surface of this right TMJ. And you can also see that the space between that surface and the fossa diminished. This 3D representation here shows uh, signs of subchondral cyst formation, which you can clearly see that area there, as well as erosions. Um, on the superior surface of the condyle. Now, it is important when you view a CBCT to follow a, system, a systematic approach um, and really to identify all normal anatomy present in an image. So you've got to have a profound knowledge of the variation of the normal appearance um, to be able to recognize the abnormal. Um, I just want to... Uh, quickly talk about the key points to remember when using a um, CBCT. 
And this is nicely summarized by Dr. Miles in his article, Reporting Findings in the Cone Beam CT uh, Tomography Volume. Just want to briefly talk about three points here, is that you've got to remember if your field of use size um, is quite large, you're going to acquire image, um, <clears throat> image volume that's outside of the scope of practice of normal dentistry. And unfortunately, you will have to report on that, um, uh, on that structures as well. He also says that who provides a report may not be as important as whenever, uh, whether a report is actually performed. So you've got to, if you do take CBCTs or any other radiograph for that matter, you've got to report on your findings. And then you, another thing to remember is that the quality and the accuracy and the use of a report are subjected to uh, medical legal scrutiny. This here is from the Directorate of Radiation Control. Um, and it just, I just took this out of the, um, <clears throat> out of the document. And it's just state that uh, under patient records that a record or a register must be kept for all patients undergoing X-ray examinations. The record or register must be preserved for five years containing the following information. And I want to go to this bottom one, a brief statement of the diagnostic information obtained from the examination. So you've got to report on your findings and you've got to write it down in a patient file. Now, what usually happens is if you do report on this, um, like I said, it's important to, to, to follow a systematic uh, approach. What should be included in a report is the diagnosis, um, <clears throat> The, the image study that was performed, um, as well as the scan parameters that you used. Then you've got to include the patient's history and indications for the scan, your image, uh, the image quality. If it's not suitable, obviously you, you've got to say that. You've got to include your findings. And then you've got to lastly, just give your impression um, of what you found and recommendations. Okay, so that's a nice structured report, uh, CT report that one can use when reporting. Now, this is just, uh, if you look at any radiograph, you should follow some kind of chart or algorithm in your evaluation. And this is usually what I, I like to do is to, to look at, if I do a radiographic analysis, so that, is it a normal variation or is it abnormal? If it is abnormal, then it falls into, is it a developmental abnormality, uh, abnormality or acquired one? Um, if it's a quiet one, then you've got to go and make a differential diagnosis of is it a cyst, a benign neoplasm, malignant neoplasm, inflammatory lesion, or just a bony dysplasia, vascular abnormality, metabolic disease, or trauma. Okay, so if you follow this type of thing um, to report on, you can't really you can't really miss anything. Okay, so I'm going to start with uh, showing you some cases um, that we've been involved with. So this radiograph, uh, panoramic radiograph, was taken um, <clears throat> to evaluate the wisdom teeth, as well as this uh, curious two six here. But on this panoramic radiograph, it was quite clear that there was a well-circumscribed uh, radiopaque structure um, <clears throat> that was noted here in this uh, left ramus area. Now, I just want to show you that if you look at that structure and you this, it's, it's only unilateral on the left-hand side. You can't see it on the right-hand side. We didn't know what it was. I didn't know what it was, and we decided to do a CT. Now, here you can see a CT image of that same patient, or combing CT image of that same patient, and you can see these bony projections on the left and uh, <clears throat> on the right-hand side. So we, we got to the conclusion that this is either an enlarged lingula, because it was in that area, or that it was part of your mandibular ligament that was calcified. And that's the insertion of that ligament in that area. So one will have to take this into account when you're doing an inferior alveolar block in this patient. You can see that that's going to prevent you from getting anesthesia. Just for to recap a little bit of anatomy, here's a nice image to show you that sweno uh, mandibular ligament and where it attaches to. So you can see that it sort of gives you the same appearance that we saw on that um, CBCT image. Something that we deal with every day is periapical uh, radiolucencies. And you've got to 
<clears throat> when it comes to periodical radiolucency, it's it's really important to take a proper history and to do a thorough a, a clim clinical examination for a patient because that's going to tell you already half of the story. So if you do this, this look at the lesion or a condition like a periapical granuloma cyst, it's going to be associated with a non-vital tooth. Um, if you look at something like periapical osseous dysplasia, um, it's going to be in a specific group like black females, and the teeth are usually vital. Or a periapical scar, usually endodontically treat a tooth with a destruction of the cortical plate, and then it can even be something like your dental anomalies, like a dental dysplasia type 1 or some of your radicular type um, <coughs> dysplasias, where you'll see periapical granulomas or cysts. So if you look at that periapical radiograph there, um, you can clearly see that this radiolucency is associated with a non-vital um, tooth. Um, there's a little bit of widening of the PDL space there. Uh, there's a loss of lamina dura, and one can see a little bit of <coughs> root absorption on that apex of that tooth. So in cases like this, vitality testing will tell you that uh, <coughs> what the diagnosis is. So CBCT is definitely not indicated in cases like this. If we look at something like that, that was a patient that was uh, came in for a second opinion um, and her dentist wanted to do an immediate implant. Um, you can see that the symptoms were, were mild on this tooth. Um, on this periapical radiograph, what you can clearly see here is that <clears throat> there is a radiolucency associated with that mesiobuccal root uh, with a loss of lamina dura. And my first thought was that they missed the MB2 canal in this area. You can also see uh, radiolucency associated with that palatal root there. And then it looks like the distal root is definitely filled short. We decided, so, or I decided to do a uh, CBCT, and this is just the, the 3D representation of that specific area. So what you can see here is that the buccal bone is intact, uh, that's overlying that 2.6, and you've got superimposition of your zygomatic arch, which you can clearly see here on this periapical radiograph as well. So that usually obscures any, anything that's lying behind us. <clears throat> What did the CT show us? Uh, you can see here that there was um, <clears throat> periapical radiolucencies associated with all the roots of that um, tooth. So here's the mesial buccal um, and palatal, as well as the distal. And you can see that there's a radiolucency around all of them. There's also displacement of your sinus floor, as well as destruction of the sinus floor, which you can see from this image. And then you've got this related uh, mucosal thickening um, associated with the floor of that sinus. <clears throat> if you look at, uh, as I mentioned, the MB2 canal, you can clearly see from this image that the quality isn't good enough to really identify if there was an MB2 canal or not because of um, <clears throat> the, the amount of scatter that we see here. Um, this tooth was extracted and <clears throat> weighted and sinus lift was performed and an uh, implant was placed later for this patient. This was a patient that, uh, <clears throat> and this is a nice case to demonstrate why it's important to investigate the entire um, radiogra uh, radiograph. Now I've included the, uh, the date here just for reference, but you can see that this patient was referred for um, <clears throat> orthodontic treatment. And what we can see from this is that there's supernumerary teeth um, there towards the back. Um, <clears throat> okay, so what happened here was that they, this was a year later. They did remove the, the uh, supernumerary teeth or their distal molars, as well as the eight. And they also removed the maxillary fours, as you can see here. Now, when the patient came to me, she, she said to me that she had, she felt a bony projection on the side, um, on the buccal side of the two six. So I clinically evaluated it and decided to do a, a small field of view CT. And this is what I saw on the CT. Now, this is the five. And you can see this is a coronal view of um, two, uh, two five. You can see that there's a periapical radiolucency there. 
as well as destruction of this buccal bone that's associated with this tooth. But there's also destruction of that whole buccal plate related to the um, three, the five, as well as the six. This is just a sagittal image of the two five, and you can see clearly see the uh, periapical radiolucency associated with the two five. Now, I just want to take you back to 2013 07. So that was the <clears throat> A radiograph that was taken before they started treatment, as you can see here. And if you clearly evaluate the 2.5, you can see that there was already a periapical radiolucency present at that stage, which was missed by the, by the clinicians. And they decided to extract a healthy 4 instead of the 5. Um, <clears throat> so that was, was missed already by that time on that initial radiograph. The little bony projection that you felt was this mesobuccal root that was uh, <clears throat> pushed out, out of the buccal plate. Um, the patient was referred to, to, to us for root canal treatment that was completed, um, as you can see here. Unfortunately, I haven't got any follow-ups on this case, but you can see that this was already two years after that initial presentation. This was a patient 30 year old <coughs> that uh, experienced quite a lot of pain during the, the root canal treatment. Um, and this was one of the student cases. And what you can see from the periapical radiographs that there's clearly a change in the tubercular bone uh, pattern uh, <coughs> between the roots of this, of this tooth, as well as you can't really follow the ligament space or the lamina dura. Um, there was also a little bit of a body projection on the buccal side and uh, decided to do a <coughs> CT. And what we saw here is you can clearly see that there's a bone reaction next to this non-vital tooth. There's also a loss of the cortex on this axial slice. Um, <coughs> and uh, this was indicated biopsy was taken for this patient and, and it luckily came back as an osteomyelitis and not something malignant like an osteosarcoma. The tooth was also uh, removed for this patient. This patient, 45 year old male, <coughs> um, came back after root canal treatment was completed. Um, this was the, the, the periapical radiograph that was taken. And you can see that there's uh, the root canal treatment, but couldn't really see anything else decided to do a small field of view CBCT for this patient. Um, and as you can see from this coronal view, this is obviously mesiobuccal and <clears throat> the mesiolingual canal here. You can see that there's bone breakdown on the lingual side of this, of this tooth. And you can also see that the trabecular pattern changed around this tooth. On this axial slice, what you can see here is a fine line there. And, and then on the 3D representation, you can clearly see a line running down. And this was then diagnosed as a vertical fracture. Now, something to remember is that uh, fractures will only be visible if the fracture is larger uh, <clears throat> than the voxel size used to reconstruct the image. Otherwise, we won't really see the fracture lines. This is also quite nice because there's not a lot of scatter around this um, <clears throat> root canal treated tooth. And that's why it was quite easy to diagnose that uh, fracture. This was an interesting case, also a student case um, that fractured a protaper file while um, <clears throat> treating this tooth. And you can see that the protaper file was fractured in the distal buccal canal. We just wanted to know where it was, if it was in the sinus, and took a CT. And as you can see from the CT, um, <clears throat> that the file was still standing up straight there. Um, we then referred this patient to, a, to the periodontal department. Um, they opened the, the sinus and this little file was still standing up in the mucosa at that stage and they could just retrieve it. <clears throat> this patient um, referred for pain on the one seven. Um, and so all of these lesions that you see here, this large radiolucency 
on the left hand side, as well as that radial lesency on the right hand side associated with that uh, partially erupted tooth or impacted tooth, were also incidental findings. So if you just have a look at that type of lesion, you can make a, a or give a differential diagnosis of something like a dentigerous cyst or a carotid cyst or even a myeloblastoma. And that there, something like a periodontal cyst. But the patient's main complaint was that one seven day, painful one seven. So the first step was to do a periapical. Um, and as you can see from this periapical that only the distal canal was, uh, was treated, was retreated. The other canals don't show up clear. So decided to, to see if, if the other canals was visible and a small CT was taken. Now, this is exactly the same image. I, the image quality wasn't great. So I just played around a bit to, to get <coughs> uh, the image a little bit better. And what you can see from this image here is that there's definitely a mesobuccal canal and even a mesobuccal two canal there, as well as a palatal canal. But posterior to this tooth, you can see that there is a large radiolucent lesion present distal of this tooth. Okay, which one can't really see on that periapical radiograph. There's just another, um, uh, another image. This is a sagittal slice. You can see that the distal canal was treated, but the other canals weren't treated. And yeah, you can clearly see that well circumscribed radiolucency associated with that posterior part of that 1.7. And that is just a 3D representation there. So <clears throat> this just showed us that the canals was accessible, but this was also indicated uh, to do a biopsy um, and get a proper diagnosis for this, for this lesion. Now, I'm going to use this pen just to demonstrate that it's that clinical and medical history is very important, especially if you're going to report for another clinician. Now, if we, I'm going to leave this and you can, can view this, I'll, I'll give it away just now. I'm going to go, to go to the next one. You'll see that this patient it turned out like that. Now I'm going to go back to that side and you can see that there's a radiolucent area there, which is quite easy to miss if you're just going to view the, uh, and not go systematically through a whole panoramic radiograph. You'll also see that there's calcifications um, next to that uh, C3 area, as well as on the left-hand side on that area there. We did do a CBCT for this patient for surgical planning because we knew the diagnosis. And here you can see the CBCT. You can see that there's a loss of that cortical bone as well as destruction of the bone. You can see that it's infiltrating in that area. And that's just a 3D representation showing that erosion on that superior surface in that area. This was a squamous cell carcinoma that was just infiltrating into that area. <clears throat> that is just a clinical photo of the resection, just to give you a, and there you can see the infiltration into the underlying bone. The CT also showed up the, the calcifications. And here you can see the calcifications in that uh, prevertebral area there. And that is just to show it on that side as well as there. So the calcifications um, was in the area of the carotid artery. And for this type of patients, you've got to refer them for further medical investigation uh, as well as additional imaging like uh, uh, ultrasound for confirmation. This was an eight-year-old, and we usually don't do um, <coughs> CBCT scans on eight-year-olds, but the periapical radiograph didn't sh really show up anything. And this patient experienced pain and swelling on the lingual surface. Um, <coughs> so we decided to do a CBCT. And what we saw here was that there was definitely destruction of the bone. So you can see, and you can see destruction of the bone on this lingual aspect there. So this lesion actually broke through into the soft tissue, and that's why there was swelling and pain on this, this area here. And from this coronal uh, section, you can also see that this radio, uh, that this uh, <coughs> restoration was placed 
right into the, the pulp. I actually touched the pulp there. And you can imagine why the, the periapical radiograph didn't really show us anything. If you're going to take a radiograph from that side, you can actually see the superimposition of all your enamel overlying this um, <coughs> composite restoration. This patient uh, complained a, of pain after the uh, removal of the 2.8. This pain just panoramic radiograph just showed us destruction of that maxillary tuberosity there, as well as you could faintly see radio patch structures in that area there. The CT showed us that there was a anteroral opening as well as a root fragment that was displaced into the sinus. So the surgeons could then go and remove that and close that area there. But you can see the amount of bone destruction that took place with that extraction. <clears throat> this is one of those cases that a patient was referred for this non-vital front tooth. And it's uh, clearly not the correct radiograph to, to ask for. Um, one would rather take a periapical, which will show you much better detail. But <clears throat> the patient, uh, after this was taken, saw this radiolucency between the two anterior teeth. Very, very faintly, you can see it there. And if you look very closely, you can also see a radiopaque structure in that area overlying the anterior nasal spine area. We decided to take the a CBCT for this radiolucency yeah, to see what's going on there. And it showed from this sag uh, sag uh, sagittal view, you can see that there was a nasopalatine duct cyst. So you can see that the canal actually expands. And something else that we picked up was a impacted or supernumerary tooth, a mesiodense that was also lying there. And that's the, that faint outline that we saw on the panoramic radiograph. This patient um, experienced pain um, on the left side. So it was on this side. Um, after the extraction, she went back to a dentist. The dentist said there wasn't anything wrong there. And then the patient eventually came, <coughs> came to us. And from this panoramic radiograph, we don't really see anything wrong. So the first thing was to do a periapical. What we noted on the periapical radiograph was this <coughs> bony projection that you can see here got this odd shape and that kind of worried me. So I decided then to, to do a small field of view CBCT. And what I saw on the CBCT was this. So what you can clearly see is that um, this is the seven, that's the mesiobuccal root of the seven. The distal buccal root was totally resected. And then there was destruction of that maxillary tuberosity towards the back. So you can see from this 3D shows it quite nicely, is that the whole maxillary tuberosity was destroyed during the removal of that wisdom tooth. And during that procedure, that distal root was also resected because it's just too straight to, to have been broken off. And this is where the patient's pain came from, from this seven. This is from uh, the palatal side. And as you can see, bone in that palatal region was also fractures. And that's the, the image that we saw on that periapical radiograph. So that fractured palatal bone on that area there. Sometimes we've also got to identify um, <coughs> where there's these broken instruments. And here you can see an instrument, but one doesn't really know where it lies on a panoramic radiograph. So the CBCT just help us to identify exactly the, the location. And here you can see where that fractured instrument was lying. It's lying on the lingual side. One wouldn't expect that, but it was lying on the lingual side. You can also see that there was destruction of the bone on that lingual side. And somebody definitely went in there with a drill because these lines are very, very straight. And one can imagine that they probably should have been damaged to the lingual nerve, which is also that runs down this area here. But the surgeons could then go in and go and retrieve that, that fractured instrument. 
Well, we also use the CBCT quite often to, um, to, to identify pathology, but also to look at the surgical planning for pathology. So here you can see a quite a large um, lesion. And this was really done before surgery to see the extent of the lesion. So one can clearly sort of see the margins where it ends here, but towards the right hand side here, it's quite difficult to see the exact extent of this lesion. So we sometimes use the CBCT to look at that. And here you can see that same patient and on this axial slice, you can actually see how far this lesion extends uh, posteriorly. So for surgical planning, this uh, helps quite out for the, for the surgeons to really do their planning. <clears throat> this patient um, also came in. There's a, there's a lesion here, but the complaint was pain on this left and upper side. Now from this panoramic radiograph, uh, one can see that there's slight changes of uh, the trabecular pattern of the bone. It looks a little bit more sclerosed. But the CT showed us this type of thing. Um, and as you can see here, that this CT was quite a large field of view CT. It's probably not indicated for, for a lesion like this. Uh, we could have uh, taken a smaller CT. But what we can see here is a ill-defined uh, radiopaque lesion um, in the soft tissue here. You can see it's extending into that soft tissue. There's also a loss of the cortex and then a change of the bone in that area there. So this is typically that sun ray appearance that you'll see. Um, and this was also then diagnosed as a osteosarcoma for this patient. I like to use this case to, to, to show you, um, <clears throat> this was a 27 year old patient that first went to his, his dentist and um, complained of pain in this left mandibular area here. The patient prescribed, uh, well, the dentist prescribed antibiotics. Um, patient returned to the, to the dentist. I can't remember the, the time span, um, but, uh, but he then prescribed antibiotics again. Uh, pain still didn't go away. And then the patient went to a maxillofacial surgeon that actually did a biopsy, but the biopsy was very superficial. So it didn't really show, it wasn't representative. Um, and then the patient uh, landed up with us. So on this panoramic radiograph, what you can clearly see is that if you look at this patient is that this patient's definitely the bone height is, is normal. There's no bone breakdown in the maxilla or the, or the mandible. But if you get to this area here, this posterior left-hand side area, there's a couple of changes, small changes that one can see. First of all, one can see that there's radiolucencies associated with this eight. You can see that there's a little bit of widening of the PDL space. There's also an opening here, which shouldn't be. And then you can see that there's breakdown of the bone associated with this 237. The apical radiolucencies, one wouldn't expect that either because there's no caries on this tooth. So it's still a vital tooth. So this is really a question that the, uh, it, it must raise uh, the red flags if you see something like this. We took a CBCT for this patient. And what we saw here was, uh, <clears throat> first of all, one can nicely see the ligament widening and the bone breakdown associated with the, the, the 37. The 3D shows quite nicely here, severe bone loss around those two teeth with displacement of the eight. And one can actually see that uh, this destruction of bone on the lingual surface here as well, with bone loss on that lingual surface uh, more pronounced than the, than the buccal surface. Now, this is how the patient uh, ended up with. The diagnosis was an osteosarcoma and they decided then, uh, well, that is the treatment for osteosarcoma, um, a resection of, or hemisection of that, of the mandible. <clears throat> so you can see that small little osseous changes on the panoramic radiograph, but much more pronounced on the CBCT. Now to get back to that initial um, <clears throat> radiograph, where I asked, the, asked you if you will take a CBCT. Um, 
Now, if we would look at uh, the right hand side here, you'll see that there's a multilocular lesion in the area overlying or part of the ramus and the coronoid. Okay, so you've got your mastoid air cells here, but you can see that this multilocular lesion actually extends anterior, and you can see that appearance of that multilocular lesion right over this area here. So <clears throat> a CBCT was taken for this patient specifically to look at that. And yeah, you can clearly see that there's a uh, pneumatization of that whole area here. So you can see that that multilocular lesion extends right into the temporal bone, the occipital bone, as well as the parental bones. Um, <clears throat> that is what you can see there as part of the inner ear, and you can see it's also been displaced a bit. So the diagnosis of a hyper pneumatization was made in this case, um, and we will only follow up this patient. So it's nothing um, of concern. But it's quite nice to see how far this extends and what you can see on the CBCT compared to the panoramic radiograph. And that's why it's important to just give you a little bit of anatomy. Here's the normal anatomy of uh, basically the same areas. And you can see that the mastoid air cells are quite small compared to what we see on this image extension right to the anterior part here. And there's just another image to show you where you will find your ear, the inner ear with the cochlea and the semiluminar ducts. Um, and you can see that it was clearly displaced in that patient. And that is my presentation for tonight. So I don't know if there's any questions. Thank you very much. And then, um, yes, any questions from, from anybody? And then I'll discuss. Thank you so much, Dr. Ace. That was quite a, a mouthful. Um, we do have a few questions. The first one uh, is, um, okay, anonymous attendee. What do you charge per patient for the scan? Um, yes, uh, this, I, I could maybe, uh, I'm, I'm part of anatomy now, but I used to be part of the um, <coughs> Department of Oral Pathology and Oral Radiology. And the section diagnostic imaging falls within, um, within that department. So what we used to charge is uh, for the normal government patients, they would um, just pay the normal fees and get the service. But we've also, uh, we've also got a private um, <coughs> enterprise. So what happens there is the patients will actually uh, be referred. So you as a dentist can refer to the department um, on a referral. You just ask what you want to see. The patient comes in, um, the scan is then taken, um, and then you will get a, a DVD with the, uh, with the images that you can open and play with and, and evaluate as well as a report. Now for that, we charged uh, normal um, discovery rates. So it's anything from a small field that's usually around about 500 Rand, and it can go up to, for a very large field, about 1,200 Rand, if that answers the oh, question. Yeah. And yes, the patient then pays for it, um, and it, uh, the whole thing is then administered by the University of Pretoria. Okay. Oh, okay. Um, can you recommend an up-to-date textbook on the topic of CBCT? I, I'm not aware of any updated textbooks. Um, there is a nice textbook by Dr. Dale Miles um, that, that I think one can get from Amazon um, <clears throat> that, that's specifically related to CBCT. So I think if you just Google Dr. Dale Miles, it will, it will come up and yes, he's got a textbook specifically related to CBCT. But that's uh, the, 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 the most updated one that I know of. We also use um, a textbook, uh, Faro and White, but it is a little bit, uh, there's not a lot of CBCT in that. The one from Dr. Dale Mars is more specific to CBCT. Okay. okay. So there's nothing in South Africa, we have to just get it from Amazon. Yeah, unfortunately I have to get it from Amazon, yes. <laughs> Sorry. Okay. Or get your articles. <laughs> or get articles. Yes, that's that's another option. Yes. 
Yeah, okay. Um, here from Dr. Temba Majasi. Soft tissue not really well defined in the CPC team. Kindly elaborate the technique of the maxillary flow for whatever maxillary periapical lesion. Okay, so yes, you, you're right. We, can, <clears throat> we can't differentiate between different tissues. But in cases like the maxillary sinus that I showed you, um, you can see that gray level and that's associated with that floor. So that's the thickening that we talk about related to the floor. Um, so if there's tissues next to each other, uh, we usually can't differentiate between them because they show up as the same gray level. But in cases like a periapical lesion where that, that sinus floor is uh, displaced, we, we can see that. Um, and then it is a gray level, and even though we refer to it as a, a radiolucency. So we can see that changes, but if there's a lesion in the soft tissue per se in muscle, um, or for instance, if you look at the TMJ, if you wanna look at the disc or the ligament, you're not gonna see that. Unfortunately, that doesn't show up. Okay. Okay. Uh, Dr. Hank Pretoria says, thanks, Andre, very informative. Pleasure. Dr. Norman Clement says, what are you using? What are you using for the treatment of post-op pain? And what is your duration of treatment of the acute pain? What are you using for treatment of pain? Um, is, that, is that now related to, uh, to, to endo? Um, I don't know if it is uh, post-op pain. We- yeah, It's I, the treatment of post-op pain and, uh, and the duration of the treatment of the acute pain. Well, Personally, I, I, I like to use the normal run-of-the-mill um, <clears throat> things like um, Mipridol. Um, I'm quite a fan of Mipridol and Mipaid um, for, for post-op pain. Um, but I, I, I think he's referring to probably endo treatment, um, but, but that's what I usually use. The normal run-of-the-mill paracetamol combined with a, a ibuprofen um, usually works well, in my, my opinion, that's what I use. Oh, okay. And then we have Dr. Timothy. Okay, I can't pronounce the surname, so I'll skip before I say something wrong. Yeah, Stribich. Thank you. Pleasure, yeah, one of my old students. Okay, cool. And then Dr. Harish Ramji says, thank you for a lovely presentation. Thank you. And then Dr. Norman Clements, again, yes. Dr. Ace, at the, are these patients further sustained on medical on medication for pain and antibiotics? Yes, most of these cases that that, that I showed you um, either uh, they are managed by um, maxillofacial surgeons. So the the bigger lesions and that type of surgery um, get managed uh, post op in in the, the hospital setting. Um, if that answers. So they really followed up by the, the maxillofacial surgeons, especially the bigger surgeries. Um, and then they, they use the, the protocols of uh, normal pain management uh, for, for surgery. Um, <clears throat> so that's, uh, and I presume that they would, for, for, for those big surgeries, also include antibiotics. Okay. Okay. And then Dr. Werner says, why do ENT do not make use of the CBCT? Um, yes, ENTs actually do use the CBCT. Um, I know guys in private practice actually do use CBCT because you can, uh, especially for uh, the heart tissue of the ear, it's quite, the detail that you see on that is, is quite good. So you can really see the, the cochlea and uh, the ducts as well as the ossicles that you can identify in the ear. Um, they also use it for evaluation of the airway. So if you can, uh, we've got programs, unfortunately I didn't put it into the presentation, but you can trace the, the airway and look at areas where, where there's a, a thickening of the, or actually where the airway is smaller. So we can trace that and you just filter out the, the tissues around it. So it gives you quite a nice image of, um, <clears throat> of the airways. So you can do airway evaluations with CBCT. I know the guys in private practice actually do use CBCT for, for evaluations. 
But if you wanted to see any pathology related, uh, like I say, soft tissue, then they really go to medical CT or um, MRI. Okay. And then we have Dr. Eric Matlakala. He's asking, when you do root canal treatment on maxillary 6, would you recommend a CPCT before the start of the treatment so that you can be sure about the MP2 canal? Well, um, I, I, don't, I don't do um, routine CBCTs for, for my endo cases. Um, I think one, uh, with, all the, with all the research that's out, one can really, if you look at MB2 canals, um, I think the percentage of finding an MB2 canal is nearly 90%. So you know it's there and um, you know that you've got to go and look for that specific canal. So... <clears throat> Uh, I think the radiation dose is just too high to do it as a routine for, uh, for, for all um, root canal treatments on, on uh, maxillary sexes. What I do use it for if I struggle or I can see a uh, MB2 canal on a specific tooth and I can't find the canal, then it's a different story. Then I will do a, a small field of view um, CT just to identify and go and locate that MB2 canal but not routine for, for all the cases. Okay. And then Dr. Nana says, do you have any causes on the analysis of the CPCT scans? Um, <clears throat> well, the university and the uh, Department of Oral Pathology do actually do a, a diploma course, which is focused on CBCT. So um, the contact person there is Dr. Uh, Shanae Nell, which runs that diploma course. And um, yes, like I say, that's the, the only course that I know of that's actually focused on analysis of CBCT scans. So you do a little bit of anatomy as well as interpretation of CBCT scans. So that we've got one. Okay. All right. Then Dr. Spiros, I hope I pronounced your name correctly. I'm sorry if I did it wrong. Says, thank you for your insight and the informative presentation. Dr. Verna again is saying, thank you, Andre. ENT, OSAS, easy to see, etc. Okay. And then yeah. Dr. Tepiso is saying, asking, any CPCT contracts media studies in relation to the disease of salivary glands? Or uh, do, do you have any CPCT contracts media studies in the relation of the disease of the salivary glands? Yeah, I, I haven't got any, um, unfortunately, to show you. I think those are, <clears throat> because you, you, you're ejecting contrast media, that's usually done in the, in the medical setting. So it's quite difficult for us to do that type of uh, <clears throat> intervention. So that's usually done with, the, um, with a CT. But unfortunately, I don't have any uh, CBCT contrast media studies, um, especially for salivary glands. Okay. <laughs> and then Dr. Peranovic, says, great presentation, Andre. Thank you. Thank you, Vasta. And another one from Dr. Verna says, unilateral sinusitis is tooth related until proven otherwise. Okay. Yes, uh, usually your sinusitis um, is, most of the sinusitis are related to odontogenic infections. So I agree with that. Uh, unilateral on the one side, it's go and look for, a, for the cause. It's usually related to ATUs. All right. And then Dr. Neman says, do you use narcotic an analgesic on these ex okay, expensive surgery cases, endo? And could you please leave us your email? This way, a very, oh, this was a very, this was a very good lecture. I am a pharmacist and a, and a dentist, and there's so much confusion about the pain relief using narcotics. Um, yes, I, I don't use any narcotic analgesics. Um, for the extensive surgery cases in endo, um, it's usually just uh, under local. Um, my email address um, was in the beginning, um, but I can share it to you as well now. Um, it is... <clears throat> Maybe I should just type the answer here. Yeah? I don't know if anybody can see that. Um, it's my name and surname, and it's at up.ac.ca. 
So I've just answered him there. I hope everybody can see that. But it's my name, andre.uis at up.ac.za. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Let me just check if we've... Uh... Okay, this is Dr. Ushmita. Hello to Andre, who was, who was a lecturer years ago when I was a student. Thanks for an informative session. Pleasure. I can remember you as well. <laughs> All my old okay. students. Dr. Karan Ramson, thank you. Very informative. Please consider doing a lecture on, on the basics as well. Uh, anatomical markers, orientation, slices, etc., etc. I can do that. <clears throat> I can do that. Yeah, I think th that can also be that suggestion can also be put on the on the on the questionnaire that's going to come after the Zoom meeting has uh, has ended. Please make sure you 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 write that down that uh, suggestion as well, so that Sada can have that information. Dr. Liam Robinson says, thanks for a great lecture, Liam. Regards, Liam. He's also one of my <laughs> former <laughs> colleagues. Thanks, Liam. Yeah. <laughs> uh, Dr. Shonga, Pumzile Shonga says, hi, Dr. Ace. Uh, one of the students. <laughs> thank you. And uh, uh, the lecture was interesting. So probably just saying thank you for the interesting yes. lecture. Oh, and then he says, I, I, I however need more interpretation on the CPCT. So that's more another 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 uh, discussion as well. Please, Dr. Shlonga, uh, just edit on the on the questionnaire that's gonna come up after the presentation that we just need a lecture on on just defining CPCT, the terminology and and et cetera, et cetera. And then Dr. Right. Justice is asking. Uh, is there any specific PPE before and after the CPCT for the patient and service provider? Great lecture, Dr. Ace. Um, yeah, we, we, we took the normal precautions because it's basically the same as taking a, a panoramic radiograph. So as, as the, the one taking the radiograph, you would actually just uh, wear your normal uh, mask or N95 mask. With a with a screen um, and and gloves, so not any special PPE um, because you're not really generating any um, aerosols. But um, yeah, so <clears throat> nothing really. This the same uh, PPE that you'll use for taking a, a normal uh, radiograph. Okay. Oh, okay. Um, Dr. Sharon Naidu, hi Andre, thank you for the lovely talk. Does a Panorex photo, X-ray photo, still remain your first goal image, your first go-to image? Um, hello, Shane. Yes, um, <clears throat> that will still be the. It's still a nice radiograph for an overall view. So um, yes, for a first line, I would still do a panoramic radiograph. If there's really uh, something that you see specifically that you know is not going to be in the uh, in the image, like anterior region for a panoramic radiograph is not always great. Um, and you, you, with your clinical diagnosis, you, you, you think you're not gonna see it on a periapical, I would, then I would consider a CBCT. But otherwise I would take for overall impression, I would still do a panoramic radiograph as my first, first uh, radiograph. Okay. And then uh, Dr. Andy F. Ting says, thank you for interesting presentation. Dr. You. Dr. Johan van der Lieden says, thank you for the presentation. What has the nomenclature for the endodontogenic keratosis changed to? Yes, uh, that's, that's a good question. I should actually put it to my uh, pathology colleagues. Um, <clears throat> I'm still under the impression that we call it odontogenic keratosis or OKCs. So, um, <clears throat> um, I still call it an odontogenic keratocyst. I think that's the, the latest, if I'm correct. Um, but I'll, I'll, I can, can look it up for you or ask my pathology colleagues. Okay. All right. No, we, we just, uh, 
Dr. Pumdile Shlonga is actually Prof. Shlonga, the orthodontist. She just yes, hello, uh, Prof. Yes. <laughs> yes. Uh, sorry about that, Prof. Apologies. And then we have Dr. Willie Van. Okay, just Dr. Willie. Nice talk, Andre. Yeah, that that was that's the head of department for oral pathology. Right? Thank you, Prof. <laughs> <laughs> oh, good. And then we have Dr. Shane Nell. Um, excellent presentation by an excellent radiology mentor. So that's a compliment yeah. for you there. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, also a colleague and uh, one of my former students, MSc students. Awesome. <laughs> okay. Um, I, I think we've answered all the questions. Let me just... Um, Yeah, I, I think most of the questions have been answered. Um, thank you, Dr. Ace. Thank you, colleagues, for attending. Um, please make sure that you, you, you fill in the survey after this presentation. And please register for the SADA Congress. It's on the 27th to 29th of August. It's, gonna, it's going to be a virtual one. Um, so yeah, SADA already has um, the link up on their website. If you haven't had the, the email, if you haven't received the email about the Congress, please let's register.